Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. That's partial credit. All right, we we'll want you to be a little more lively. If you can come to that football game on, on Saturday, that would be good to raise the volume just a little bit. And one thing I do want to remind you, um, the executive MBA programs are going to be having a tailgate right out here uh, outside the College of Business. So if you'd like to come, they will have food, drink. I think the, uh, uh, they'll also have visors and a T-shirt. <laughs> Uh, they are also hoping to create a very large crowd. We have 292 people registered as of about an hour ago when I checked, but they're hoping to do this Lane Kiffin look-alike contest. So with your money, you get a white visor and a white long sleeve t-shirt, and they hope to get like all 200 and some people <laughs> dressed in the outfit Lane is wearing on that billboard out there and, and sort of see. So, uh, at any rate, you're all, you're all invited. There is that modest charge, but you will walk away with uh, not only food, drink, uh, but also uh, paraphernalia there. So that's great. Tonight, uh, we welcome a person who has a long and distinguished record and represents a different industry segment with a great company that's headquartered right here in Boca. Jeff Stoops uh, is a proud graduate of Florida State University with both his undergraduate degree and his law degree. Um, he unfortunately, like me, was uh, a little upset at that football game uh, earlier this week, and uh, he was actually up there in the stadium. So, um, any rate, but Jeff has a, has a long career in the law area. You guys have his profile. Uh, what I'll tell you is he was with uh, Gunster in a major role, and at that point was the legal counsel for SBA, I believe. And then SBA got him to come over and become the in-house counsel and move into the executive suite. So he moved up from there uh, to be uh, the, the chairman and director of the company and then became the CEO of SBA Communications in 2002. SBA, for those of you that don't know, is a company that basically makes the uh, poles and owns the land from which the companies whose names you know, like Verizon and AT&T, rent space. So they put their equipment up there. These guys make money building uh, the towers, owning the land, and uh, renting space on them. They're one of the very largest of these sorts of companies, not only in the US, but they're expanding internationally. So their footprint is growing tremendously. It's, the company has been tremendously successful under Jeff's leadership. Uh, I joke that if I had bought that stock when I first met Jeff five years ago and was impressed with what they were doing, uh, I would now have quadrupled my money, if not more, and probably be answering questions from the Securities and Exchange Commission <laughs> because the returns look that good. Uh, Jeff is a, is a great guy. He's a leader in the community. Not only is he tremendously successful as a CEO, uh, but he serves on numerous community boards and activities. He's been uh, serving on our College of Business Advisory Board. He was the FAU Business Leader of the Year here a couple years ago. He now is uh, serving on the Kravis uh, Board up in West Palm Beach. I'm just turning the volume up. All right. When Tanya approaches me that rapidly, it looks like something's happening. So <laughs> bear with me. Uh, he has been um, the director and past chairman of the board of the Wireless Industry Association which is the leading trade agency in his industry. Uh, he's, as I say, a currently a member of the board of directors of the Kravis Center for the Performing Arts in West Palm Beach, uh, Florida. Uh, he's also on the board of directors of the entity responsible for the Honda Classic PGA Golf Tournament, uh, former chairman of the board of St. Andrew's School here in Boca Raton, uh, and just an all-around wonderful guy who's got a great story and a lot of wisdom to impart. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Stoops. Good evening. How Better? Yes, All right, good, good. Well, let's have some fun with this tonight. I don't want to drone on for like 45 minutes and then you ask questions and stuff. So we're going to do like audience participation. I'm going to call on some of you and you ask questions as we go and let's, let's have some fun. As, as we go through this. So here's a little bit. Tanya. 
slide it to on. Okay, I can do that. I'm in the telecommunications business. <laughs> All right, so here's a little bit about me. I have had two companies that I've worked for in my whole career since I got out of school. I was with uh, Gunster, uh, which is a big law firm based here in Florida. Actually, they're only in Florida. They've grown since I left them. I was based in the West Palm Beach office. Is anybody here like trying to become a reformed lawyer and is like trying to get into business and leave that nasty law practice stuff behind? No, nope. nobody's doing that. Okay. Um, so I was there for 13 years, starting from the ground up. You know, first year lawyer doesn't know anything and kind of did all. And I and actually really liked it. And and I did not leave because I disliked the practice of law. I left because I was really looking for something more. I was looking to be the principal. You know, as a lawyer, particularly what I was doing, I wasn't in the courtroom. I was in the transactional practice. I was buying and selling businesses and helping companies raise money. And that's really an advisory role. So I, what I really was interested in doing was being the person who got to make the decisions and you know, living or dying based on those results. So I was looking for an opportunity to go jump to the client side. And I met uh, Steve Bernstein, who was the S and the B of SBA. SBA is Steve Bernstein and Associates. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, and we got to know each other. I became his lawyer. And then he made me the proverbial offer that was too good to refuse in 1997. That's when I uh, left to join SBA. And I've been there ever since. So my wife and I have been in town since 1984. Came down here sight unseen from Palm Beach County. Little car, U-Haul, just trucking down from, from Tallahassee and, and been here ever since. Raised four kids and uh, have looked back with, uh, with a great degree of uh, joy and happiness. So I have been CEO since 2002. And that puts me in a unique situation. And it actually puts me in a 10% club. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody have a guess? That's the number of people in S&P 500 CEOs who have been in their jobs for 15 or more years. Does anybody know what the average tenure today is of an S&P 500 CEO? Close. Five and a half years. It's not long. A lot of targets on, on your back today because it's all about how do you stay in that job? Which, mean, which translates into, what's it really mean? Stock price. There you go. So here's a little bit about SBA. It was founded in 1989, founded in Pittsburgh. It was moved to Boca Raton in 1994. Why was it moved to Boca Raton? Say again? Cheaper No. 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 The weather sucks in Pittsburgh. We could, do, we could do whatever we wanted to do from anywhere. So Steve Bernstein said, I'm not going to do another winter in Pittsburgh. We're going to move to Boca Raton. So we moved down here in 19, this was before I joined the company. So we moved down here in 1994. We are basically a landlord. We are a landlord to the wireless carriers. We're sometimes called vertical real estate, vertical apartment buildings. We are the towers. When you think about what we do, we own the steel and we rent out slots on the towers. Really simple business. Very, very simple business. And, and you think about what we do and you think, wow, high tech and all that. It's really not. It's very low tech business. It's dirt, it's steel, and it's legal rights. We don't have any of the um, technological obsolescence because the carriers own all the equipment. They're the ones who have to you know, deal with all the fast changing equipment and the phones and all that stuff. We just basically house the places where the antennas and the radios go and provide the spots. 
That's why it's been such a defensible business over the years. We are a real estate investment trust, which means we have to qualify as real estate under the uh, federal tax code. And we, uh, we qualified for that and filed for that in January of 2016. Does anybody know what that means? What, what, why is that a good thing? Tax Say again? Tax differently? Yes. How so? Say again? Depreciation. In part. The beauty of being a REIT is you never pay income taxes at the, at the corporate level. And, and, but you have to pay out 90% of your taxable income as a dividend. But that's why REITs are, are valued higher than a lot of other companies because the holder of the REIT stock knows what? You're going to get cash. You're going to get cash. So we're a, we're a leading owner and operator. Uh, we, we say wireless communications infrastructure, but when you read that, it, read towers. That's what we do. And I'm going to show you some different towers and what they look like. We've, got, we've grown very large. We're almost 30,000 sites now over the Western Hemisphere, which is where we have chosen to, uh, to focus our attention. And we're a publicly traded company under the symbol SBAC. So here's a little video uh, that is going to kind of set the stage for who we are. What does it take to build better wireless? To be smart, to be tough, to be adventurous, to have a focused passion beyond tomorrow, to empower wireless innovation, construct opportunities, and invest in a collective future. To share, shape, and expand a virtually limitless wireless infrastructure, a network with global reach comprised of far more than information, data, images, and video. A network of landowners, partners, technicians, climbers, buildings, towers, and people. All coming together to create solid, dependable connections. It takes a team with a focused passion and a shared vision to build, support, and enhance the wireless infrastructure of today and tomorrow. From strategically located towers to exceptional customer service, every part of SBA Communications has been built from the ground up by a dedicated, trusted, and experienced company driven by a steadfast commitment to excellence, respect, and a strong work ethic. SBA is what it takes to build better wireless, to bring us all one step closer to a life untethered. One step closer to a truly wireless world. SBA, your signal starts here. I, I have to laugh. You, you obviously got our ADA compliant version where we actually tell you what we're saying as we're as we're. <laughs> As you get past this education, you will learn there are some crazy things in life. When we redid our website, we had to spend a fortune to add those words and the little music symbols when the music's playing, because the law now requires that. And if you don't do that, there is a group of lawyers out there who just scan companies' websites, and if you don't have that, they sue you. So welcome to, welcome to the real world. So this is where we started, Steve Bernstein, in that middle office in Pittsburgh. That's where SBA got its start. Steve Bernstein was working for a company called McCall Cellular. Does anybody remember that name? Yeah. Craig McCall? Yeah. Craig McCall was one of the pioneers in wireless and what his company is now um, what, what basically is AT&T Wireless. I mean, AT&T Wireless is a 
today a function of a bunch of companies that have been rolled up, but McCall Cellular was one of them. And Steve is a fabulous guy. He continues to serve as our chairman of the board. And he um, basically heard Craig McCaw speak. Steve was selling phones at the time. He was not doing what we're doing today. But he heard Craig McCaw speak, and Craig McCaw was quite the visionary and quite the speaker. And Steve really got the bug when he heard Craig speak and said, wow, this is really going to go places. Um, and this was a long time ago, before when when really cell phones were not even portable. They were basically wired into your car. There's not a lot of you who probably remember that, but the first cell phones weren't even, you couldn't even carry them around. They were, they were wired into your car. That was the first cell phone. Uh, and Steve was selling those, but the vision that Craig McCall spoke about was something that was gonna be much more pervasive, much more expansive. So Steve quit his job and decided to start a company which would be uh, centered around helping the carriers find places to locate their antennas, called site development or wireless siting. And what it really was was a specialized services and construction company. You go find the site, you go negotiate with the landowner to um, get a piece of land to either put an antenna on or build a tower. You get the zoning, you get the permitting, you, you negotiate the leases, and you, um, then you manage the construction, and then you turn the project over to the carrier who owned the asset at the end of the day. Now, what, what was that kind of business model? Think about that business model. What was that associate? What, what kind of capital requirements did that have? No, very little, because it was a it was a services business. The carriers owned all the assets. We were just the services provider. Yeah, that it was all owned by the carrier. So we were out there basically spending their money to go do their bidding, do their work. We were contractors. But it was important because we were learning skills and learning where, where they were engineering their networks. So Steve started this entire business off of three credit card. He got three credit cards, $10,000 each, maxed them out, and that's how SBA got started in this office in Pittsburgh. Here is our timeline. By 1996, Steve had grown the business to be the largest site acquisition and construction consulting firm in the country. About $9,600 million in revenue. But again, it was all services business. It was all fee-based business. It was project driven. You go do a big build out for the carriers in a geographic area. <clears throat> you're done. You move on. Steve began to worry about, gee, how long can this last? I mean, this is really going well, and we're making a lot of money, but how long can this build-out last? We need to find a way to um, stop this uh, reliance on the project business, because the project business is a hard business. You, you, you got to hire employees, and then when the project's over, you either got to find another place for them, you got to move them around the country. If they don't want to move, you got to fire them. And, if you, and if, it, if you can't move them over here where you need them, you got to hire. It's very, very difficult to do that. We were good at it because at that time, the workforce was mostly young, um, single folks who were very mobile and went from place to place. Uh, but still, there were a lot of complications. So it was a right around this time that Steve decided, well, we need to get into the asset ownership side of things. And it was fortuitous because it was just around this time that the wireless carriers began to open up their willingness to let other people, third parties, own their infrastructure. Prior to this time, the wireless carriers didn't let anybody own their towers. Why do you think that was? That way they get the sole profit. Competition, keep people out. Great question, great question. Prior to the mid-90s, there were only two licensed carriers in every location. And they had a cozy duopoly. 
and they didn't really compete that much. Wireless, wireless wasn't that prevalent. It was a luxury back then. I mean, it wasn't anywhere near like it is today. I mean, phone calls were expensive. It was like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't make that call. It, you know, somebody either has to be dying or I'm in an accident. Or that's what people used to think like when they made wireless calls back in those days. It wasn't like today. Um, and it was a luxury item. Everybody had a landline phone, and you only really used your wireless phone in case of emergency. But in 1996, the government wanted to expand and make wireless much more competitive. So they auctioned off a bunch more licenses to create competition. And, and that gave rise to what is today Sprint, T-Mobile, and you know now today you have four. And for a while, you had eight. Carrier, and that's all been consolidated down to four. So what the, cust what the carriers decided, and this was a huge sea change, and this is the only way that our business, the independent ownership of towers could have ever come about, they decided that it was no longer strategically necessary to own our own towers, but it was more important for us to get money to expand and in marketing and equipment. And if they hadn't made that decision, there would be no SBA, no American Tower, and no Crown Castle, because the carriers would have still continued to own their towers. And there's a, still a dynamic and a friction today about, even though they've made a ton of money selling towers to our industry, there's a lot of friction about the rents that they pay and things like that. But it was, that was a sea change that allowed our industry to develop. So that was about the time that Steve said, okay, well, let's move into the asset ownership side of the business. And, and that's when he and I met. He needed a lawyer. Because what do you need, what do you need to get into the um, ownership side of the business? Capital. Money. What did we have before that suited us well? Well, we had the know-how, right? We had the employees. We knew how to build towers. We knew where the good locations were because we'd been doing it for a long time. What were we missing? Money, right? Because services is not a high capital intensive business, but asset ownership was. So I, I, we met. I became his uh, securities lawyer. And just as we were completing the, the first and actually the only private equity raise that SBA has ever done, um, which was $102 million, he made me the you know, proverbial offer that was too good to refuse. And I joined him in May of 1997, and off we went to uh, start to build and own towers. So we went public in 99. We went public at $9 uh, a share. 18 months later, the stock hit $57 a share. We thought we were really smart. 18 months after that, the stock hit 19 cents a share. We weren't really feeling all that smart at that time. And that was at the time that the entire telecom world hit a great recession. And most of you are too young to remember this, but in 2000, in the early 2000s, there was a huge wave of fiber companies that had gone out and just built a ton of fiber, somewhat similar to today, but with a lot more um, recklessness. And all these companies went out of business. So the credit markets pulled back tremendously. And at that time, we had a lot of debt. We had not really made the transition to asset ownership, which is a much more stable, much more predictable, much more recurring revenue stream. So we were still very much a services business, which you know has its ups and downs. So we were in trouble. And you know, there were five public tower companies at that time. Two of them had already gone bankrupt in the sense that they had declared Chapter 11, had to reorganize, their equity was wiped out. Their debt holders became the equity holders. And we were thought to be the, um, the next one. But through a lot of you know, determination and hard-headedness, um, 
we took a different path and we sold off some towers that allowed us to pay off some debt and stabilize our capital structure and we worked our way out of it. And, uh, you know, thank goodness we did. And as we look back on, you know, there's a lot of proud moments in our history, but none prouder than uh, avoiding uh, Chapter 11 uh, in 2003. We went uh, international for the first time in 2009. We hit a billion dollars of EBITDA for the first time in 2015. We elected uh, REIT status in 2016, and last year we became uh, part of the S&P 500. We've done extremely well uh, financially, which is why I still uh, sit in the seat that I do. Um, over the years that uh, we've been a public company, we have compounded shareholder returns at 16% per year. You will not find many companies that do that. You'll find some, but you won't find a whole lot. We're not well known for obvious reasons. We don't sell at retail. We have basically four customers. Um, you know, you can't find an SBA store, uh, but we're a big company in Florida. We are the eighth largest public uh, company by market cap and a lot bigger than, you know, a lot of folks that you hear about all the time, like AutoNation and Office Depot, all of which are great companies, all of which employ many more people, all of which have things that you can go buy and touch, but uh, we are a, a larger company by market cap. We, we are a very capital intensive business. Over the years since we went public, we've raised over 31 billion, with a B, billion dollars in financings. In a variety of markets, equity, debt. We do a lot of securitization, which is a structured form of debt where you, uh, through setting up specialized vehicles that are bankruptcy remote and using certain kinds of assets and putting on certain kinds of protections, you basically take a company, which is what we are, uh, uh, we have currently a double B rating, and we can turn our double B rating, at least for these particular in, uh, issuances, into an A rating, which means we save two to three percentage points in terms of the money that we raise, which allows us to run at much higher leverage levels, but at the same cost of all-in debt as our peers do who run at lower leverage levels. And if you look at our stock performance charts over the years, we blow away our two publicly traded peers, even though we're in the same business. And it's really all about this page here. It's the way we've capitalized the company. We run at higher leverage, but we've done it in a way that has allowed us to basically borrow at the same cost. Ninety-four percent of our revenue now comes from leasing. You know, that all started in 1997. We didn't have anything prior to that. Our towers have 1.8 tenants uh, per tower. But what's really happened lately, I mean, there was a time when there were a lot more tenants. But tenants have consolidated. Now there's really only four that you can have in any kind of meaningful way in any location. But what's happened is there's so much data now. You're consuming so much stuff. Like, like look at these two ladies here with their computers open. They're probably looking at videos and they're streaming things and looking at movies and down. And I love that stuff because that makes our company more valuable. What movie are you watching right now? <laughs> I hope it's one that takes a lot of data. That's great. So that kind of stuff has caused our customers to like really add a lot of equipment. So what, what has happened in this industry is, and, and the customers never saw it, and we never saw it either. So the equipment that they thought was going to be okay has actually had to be doubled and in some cases tripled. So what we've seen over the years is that the average revenue, not the average tenants per tower, but the average revenue per tenant has just really skyrocketed. And it's because of so much additional um, uh, equipment is needed to support um, these two lovely ladies here watching these movies. We love it. 
Um, so we're in 13 countries now um, and continuing to look for more, expanding. Our, our largest market outside the U.S. is Brazil, uh, where we have uh, over 8,400 sites. And we've got a very, very uh, extensively experienced management team, the most extensively experienced in the industry. We have a lot of longevity, a lot of stability on the team. Here's where our money comes from. You know, we're, we're a fairly um, concentrated business because as you think about it, there's four choices, right, for your phones in the United States. And if you go to any other country, there's really no more than four. And in a lot of the countries that we're in, there are three. And in some of the countries, there's only two. So it is a concentrated business. Yes, sir. As technology increases, do you foresee the, them needing less towers to capture more data and no, sir, it works exactly the opposite. And one of the great drivers of our business is the laws of physics. And the laws of physics, which are partially driven by the amount of energy and power that can be pumped through a unit and the spectrum. I mean, spectrum, you can't see it, but it's got a capacity. I mean, think of like a hose. You can only pump so much water through a hose, right? And if you've got to pump more water, you either need a bigger hose, and if you can't get a bigger hose, you've got to get another hose. Spectrum works the same way. So as more and more data is consumed, and if there's no more spectrum, you've got to have more sites. So what has happened over the years? 20 years ago, you were okay with towers, and i got a slide on this, but since you asked the question, 20 years ago, you could have towers 10, maybe 20 miles apart. That has had to come in. Density has increased because of data demands. So now carriers are having to put antennas closer and closer and closer together. Only goes up. And what else does it do? It makes their ability to move off existing towers that much harder. Makes the business really sticky. Very, very, very predictable. I love these questions. Keep them coming. Yes? Uh, how do you look at M&A outside of the U.S., and uh, how do you decide where to invest? That's a great question. Um, we look for countries that have multiple carriers because the business is no good with only one. But Are, not too many where there's a high risk of consolidation? Yes. Exactly. We like to, one of the reasons um, we are not in India today is we went to India years ago and we saw 10 carriers per market and we thought that was unsustainable and that has proven to be unsustainable. Our peers, American Tower, is undergoing some extremely painful consolidation churn. Churn is loss of tenants in India right now. Um, it will ultimately be okay for them, but right now it's pretty painful. Uh, so they're losing revenue there. So we want a growing market, good demographic. I mean, Brazil is an example of a great uh, market uh, in terms of number of wireless carriers, growing demographic. People use mobile for their um, uh, internet and their uh, data. Why, why do they use it so much down there as compared to the U.S.? Say that again? Exactly. Not as much fiber down there. There's no, no landlines. Nothing buried. Um, so it's got all the good stuff. What is, what is the drawbacks? We're experiencing it right today. If you ask me what is the single thing keeping me awake at night, I would say... Currency. Yes. Currency's killing us. Brazil's doing great, but nobody's ever going to know it because the currency is wiping out the, uh, the operating results. Now, those things are cyclical, and they'll come back, but we're a U.S. company that borrows in U.S. dollars and reports in U.S. dollars. So those things are real, and you have to consider those things. I mean, those, that, is, that is a big deal when you go international and you take your revenues in local currency. It is a big deal. And 
One way, you cannot hedge those risks. You cannot hedge operating. You can hedge your purchase price because it's a date certain. But once you are there and you've invested your capital, you can't hedge your operating results because that's too expensive. The only way to get a natural hedge is borrow money in local currency. Take your interest, take your interest expense in local currency, and then you have, um, uh, you know, an expense to offset against that, that that at least is in the local currency. Problem with doing that in Brazil is, you know, the darn interest rates are 12 percent. Yes. A little bit, but not, not a lot, not a lot. Yes. No. No, we 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 had a chicken start. Where do you where do you think the easiest place to to go would have been? Mexico. Canada. 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 We thought it was easy, but Canada is was Canada is tough. Canada, they anybody in here Canadian? All right, don't take too much offense to this. Um, <laughs> Can Canadians, I mean, they're the nicest people, but you know, you get up there and they shake their head and they say, oh yeah, and then they just do exactly the opposite. Um, they really, Canada has the world's most expensive wireless for consumers. And the reason is they don't really compete with each other and the government doesn't do anything about it. So when a company like us comes in that really is designed to help facilitate competition by, by allowing other carriers to come in and quickly deploy, we're not well received up there. So um, it's been, it's been we're, we're, our business is great. I mean, Canada has a lot of great attributes, very tough zoning, um, prices are good, but Unlike everywhere else in the world where we're welcomed, the Canadian uh, carriers, there's only three and there's usually only two in any market. So they don't really compete with each other and they have this really cozy relationship and they don't want anybody else involved. It's the darndest thing. But they're very polite, very polite. What stops you from having like just a, a subset of your company in the other country so you don't have to deal with that currency exchange? Like why not have like a Brazilian version of SBA? Well, we do. We have subsidiaries everywhere, but we, as a U.S. public company, everything gets rolled up and reported, right, under U.S. accounting gap. Um, and we fund, we borrow, go back to this page. Look at everything there. You see any foreign currency there? It's all in U.S. dollars. So it's all in U.S. dollars. All has to be repaid in U.S. dollars all has to be reported in U.S. dollars. And that is the risk of being, um, being in countries where you get paid in local currency. And what has to happen is the growth has to outstrip the currency issues. And last year, it was great. We actually had a big headwind in, or big tailwind in Brazil, where the currency actually improved. Not only did we do, we, and we've done great operationally in Brazil. If you, if you adjust for, and we do this because otherwise you drive your people crazy. I mean, think, think about this if you were like an SBA employee in Brazil and you busted your tail every day and you did great things and then you walked home and like it was all wiped out by the currency. Be like, what am I doing? I mean, you know, how do, I, how do I feel good about myself? So when we manage the business at the, at the local levels, we, we strip away currency and we manage it on a local currency basis because that's really the only fair thing to do. How are you doing on a constant currency basis? And we're doing great. It's just that currents, by the time you translate all that back into U.S. dollars, which is what your investors care about and what your banks care about, um, you know, that's what makes it more difficult. But last year, um, actually the currency improved. So not only did we do great operationally, but because the currency improved against the dollar, it's like we got to count every Brazilian dollar 
as like 1.3. So it was the best of all worlds. But now this year, it's actually gone quite, quite the opposite direction. And that's going to happen. Yes? Yes. Other is going to be um, cable and wireless, which is a, a big uh, Panamanian customer. It's going to be Millicom, big Central American uh, customer. It's going to be Tim, Brazilian customer. Then it's going to be a lot of government. I mean, we see uh, uh, FBI, CIA governments, local uh, police and fire, they're all, all customers. Yes? Uh, a lot of the countries you named are Latin American. Is there a reason why uh, your company hasn't moved into Africa or um, Asian countries? We're <coughs> continuing to evaluate that. Um, we chose Latin America first because why? South Florida, right? Natural. Same time zones, built-in workforce, and it's been great for us. We just kind of went where it was logical to go with the South Florida, lo where the South Florida location. When you start crossing time zones and your, your workforce is separated now by six, seven, ten hours, it adds, it adds complications. Yes? It's going to make it very challenging. It's going to make it very, very challenging um, because the costs of building towers are costs of steel, things like that. Those things aren't going down. So the, the amount of money that uh, carriers will be able to spend on towers, uh, the amount of profit that will be left for the tower industry is going to, is going to get squeezed. But they need capital. There will be a happy medium in there somewhere. Will it be as profitable as the US? No. Will there be a business there that will make some money? Yes. There's a great article in today's Wall Street Journal on exactly that point. Um, and it's about the new Reliance Geo business and how that's changing, um, how that's bringing uh, internet, 4G internet to people in India who've never had any kind of wireless before. Yeah. Are you Reliance Geo? Yeah, and they did that in response to what Reliance Geo is doing. Right, and, and they're bringing it to people who've never, never had it before, and also making phones cheaper. Yeah. Yes? What's your average uh, cost of power now, excluding the lane? Cost In the U.S., it's about 250, 250,000, maybe 275. What was the question? Average cost of a tower to build? That's to build. So here's uh, our international expansion. Canada was first, and Costa Rica was right there. We actually targeted Costa Rica because it was the last country in the Western Hemisphere where there was uh, total control of the wireless by the government. So prior to 2009, there was only one wireless carrier in Costa Rica. It was uh, owned and run by the government. Uh, they auctioned off Spectrum. Uh, in that year. They wanted three new players to come in. Only two came in. Uh, so now you have three uh, actually pretty robust, pretty evenly divided uh, carriers in Costa Rica. It's been a fabulous market for us. Um, and they're basically evenly divided. The government, 33%, uh, Telefonica, 33%, and Claro, which is America Movia. And then we just started to expand through the Western Hemisphere, primarily in Costa Rica first. Uh, which has been probably our most successful region. Uh, and then uh, Brazil, 
in a big way. And then we've uh, looked to expand throughout other parts of South America. We have stayed away from places where uh, if I go to sleep at night, I would have nightmares about whether I would own the towers the next day. Like, for example, Venezuela. Venezuela. Can't go to Venezuela. Um, so, you, you, I mean, you spend a lot of money in our business. You see how much money we've raised, and it's, you know, the debt is a two-edged sword. Um, it's great when it works because it levers the equity returns. You make a lot of money when it's well managed. It has to be paid back. So you don't want to do anything that, you know, unduly risks that. And you got to make sure you own your assets at the end of the day. So when you ask the question, um, you know, what are you looking for in a country, can't go anywhere where there is a risk that we lose the assets. You can't go anywhere unless you know the people. Well, right. That's, that's for sure. So that, that takes out, that statement I just made takes out other countries around the world. Where, based on that, where else would we not go? China wouldn't allow us there. You are not allowed uh, in China if you uh, have anything to do with telecommunications. Not allowed. You're not allowed to, to take any, any role in their telecommunications system. Where else wouldn't we go? Cuba won't allow us in for the same reason. But we wouldn't go to Russia, and of course we wouldn't go to North Korea. Yes? Um, out of all those countries on the screen, what is the hardest, what is the most challenging and why? It varies. It varies based on the, the timing. Nicaragua was going great till the civil unrest. Now Nicaragua is, is a worry. I don't think it's going to go the way of Venezuela. But um, you know, customers aren't investing in Nicaragua the way that they were. Um, you know, I worry about our employee safety there. Uh, so that's that's a worry. Brazil is always front and center because it's so disproportionately larger than the rest of these. It's like, you know, if Brazil sneezes, we catch an international cold. Um, just because of its size. Um, we had an issue in Ecuador, which just shows you how, how diff difficult it is. Um, you know, towers are basically unregulated, which is another very good thing about our business. But somebody in Ecuador decided that they wanted to regulate towers. came out of the blue. It was going to be price regulation of towers. And it's like, what? And, you know, we had to mobilize... Uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, lawyers and lobbyists, and ultimately we got it all worked through. But you know that was um, that was a, a surprise, and so we've had uh, we've had all kinds of. This is this country's a, a concern right now, and we we haven't been in Argentina long, um, about a year. We went in with great hopes because it had a lot of the same um, favorable dynamics as Brazil growing population, a lot of uh, wireless need, going to go right to wireless or not going to go to, to landlines. But the currency, I mean, the currency is just going crazy in Argentina. I mean, what was worth, you know, a dollar uh, just two months ago is worth 33 cents today. Yeah. Yes. SBA is not in Europe because we have tried and we have been outbid by European infrastructure funds that settle for three, four, five percent returns, and we're still looking for double-digit returns. Yeah, and they borrow those those guys borrow against the euro, and euro-based borrowing rates are, in some cases, zero percent today. Yeah, we're at, we're outbid with by companies who will just take lower returns than we're looking for. We'd actually, we actually would rather, and we have in fact bought our stock back instead. Yes? Why not Mexico? Um, we might have missed the boat on Mexico. We 
chose not to go into Mexico because when we made that decision, Mexico was dominated by America Movia, which is the firm owned by Carlos Slim. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard that name, right? He's one of the world's richest men. Um, and he also owned his own tower company. So for us to go into Mexico to compete with Carlos Slim, who controls Mexico, the world's richest man, I didn't think that was a good smart idea. Um, since we made that decision, Mexico has since passed regulations to reduce his control and his power, and AT&T has entered Mexico. So Mexico looks like it is a better, more competitive market, um, and you're not so reliant on Carlos Slim. But we might have missed our opportunity. We're still looking at Mexico. Yes? Satellites aren't really um, a replacement for mobile. Satellites will work to provide um, signals to fixed locations, but you can't get an uplink, you can't get enough power out of something that you're holding in your hand or it'll burn your hand off to go back to a satellite. So satellites aren't really um, ever going to replace terrestrial based networks. So we're watching, of course, all that. And you know, the Google and uh, Facebook, they're working with balloons and drones and things like that. Those are all more niche products. Um, but what really we do is we just watch what the carriers are doing. And they've had a steady evolution over the last 20 years of closer and closer and closer cell sighting. And that's, that's what we do. Yes. Heights in general are coming down because the signal works better when it's closer to the end user. Uh, when cellular was first deployed, antennas were mounted typically above 200 feet. Now they're closer to 100, and you've heard about small cells. Well, those things are being mounted at 15, 20 foot levels on street, street uh, poles. So yes, there has been a steady reduction in heights, uh, which is also added to the density. So here's where we are currently. More to come. And somebody asked about other continents. Because we are looking for higher returns and we're comfortable with reasonable risks that we've evaluated, it's more likely for us that we will find opportunities in Africa and Asia than it is in Europe. So here's been some of our performance over the years. Pretty darn good. We always like to say we, we like the grass growing from left to right. AFFO is a uh, real estate investment trust term of art. It's basically the cash that you have left over after you've paid all your obligations. It's cash flow. Yes? Do you associate this turn on knowing your customer or industry experience? Um, quality assets, experience, um, Sticking to what we know, and you know, being in a good, being in a good business. Yes. Are you not concerned with um, things like the PE ratio of your stock currently? I mean, it's quite high for an industry. And I'm curious as to how you guys are going to sustain that type of growth for the next five or six years. Because uh, the PE in our stock is totally irrelevant. We're not an E company. We're a we're a cash flow company. That's what you got to pay attention to. We, we, we have run very high depreciation, but the real amount of money that has to be 
pump back, the real cash that has to be put back into the physical plant to keep it running is very small. How small? We have a, well, we run about 20, well, I don't want to misspeak, it's in our last earnings report, but it's 1% of revenue maybe? Yeah, it's don't, don't look at PE, look at, look at AFFO per share. And we traded about a 20 times. Yeah, if you look at PE, you're like, wow, what's this company doing? But it's not, it's, we're not a PE company, it's cash flow. Don't ever look at PE. <laughs> can, you take, can you take E down to Publix and buy something with it? You take cash flow down to Publix. So here's some fun stuff. We got people in this room who use their phones like 20 hours a day. I'm looking at them. This is great. I mean, you believe that, right? Average American checks their phone 100 times a day. You can see that, right? This is a wireless world. We've been very, very fortunate to be in the business that we're in. In places like Brazil and Argentina, I mean, they don't, they're not going to know anything else. My kids will never have a landline phone. Any of you have landline phones? Very few. Very few. 20 years ago, most of the hands would have been raised. 20 years from now, no hands will be raised. So here's how it all worked. Nineteen eighty four. First cell phone went into a car, had to, be, had to be wired in and run off the car battery. Couldn't carry it. It was a big suitcase. Yes, sir? You were talking about your stock price in the, uh, the gloomy days. Did y'all undertake a uh, first stock split? No. No. Did not. Those are illusory. I mean, you, you can do that to save a listing, but that's all, all you would do that for. They don't, and typically when you do that, you lose more value. Yeah. So that, that was the big deal, that 1996 Telecommunications Act. That's when, that's when they allowed more spectrum. That's what gave rise to what is today the Sprint and the T-Mobile companies, although a lot other companies have come and gone since then that are now rolled up into those companies. OmniPoint, does anybody remember that company? Did you ever have an OmniPoint phone? They were here. Um, yes? I know the government tries to create more competition, but do you ever worry that AT&T will just build more towers? It is not in AT&T's best financial interest to build more towers um, because it's better for them to co-locate on our towers than it is for them to build their own. Because we trade at 20 times cash flow, they trade at six. So it actually behooves us to pay them more to come on our tower, then it will cost them to do their own thing. That's also why they've all sold their towers to us. Yes? I'm going to piggyback off of that. Um, how large is your build to suit or tower development pipeline? Are there a lot of build to suit opportunities in the future? And are you seeing the carriers still investing in getting new towers built? Or are they upgrading their existing equipment that they have? 
That's seven questions in one. <laughs> um, build the suit pipeline is several hundred. We're very selective because we hold out for uh, very good economics. Um, unfortunately, there's this has been such a great business that there's a lot of money chasing this business, which um, what happens when a lot of money chases things happens and this is a this this you could ask this question in any business and the answer would be the same thing when too much money chases things what happens reduces returns truism it's a lesson that will bite you at some point in your lives um, so there's a lot of money chasing our industry and the carriers have um, taken advantage of it. So there's a number of people out there who are building what we think are stupid towers. Um, so we'll build a couple hundred, what we think are really good towers, but there are more towers being built. Um, and there continues to be a good need for more towers. And it ties back into something that I said earlier. Why will there always be more towers needed? Exactly. Good, good job. Um, so yeah, more towers are always needed because of shrinking densities. All right, I got three of them. What, give, me some, give me some more. What, oh, okay. um, are they just up to, upgrading their equipment? They are, they're constantly, and this is a, a benefit that we didn't really see, um, but you know, thankfully we, we have uh, inherited. Nobody really knew how all this was gonna play out. And what has happened is, um, Carriers generally replace their equipment every three years. Not because of weather, but just because of upgrades and technology. So when they do that, the way our leases are written, every time they touch a, their site, they potentially, but we don't always charge, but potentially they owe us more money in the form of increased rents. Basically like, all right, if you have a three bedroom apartment, right? and you want to add a room, you're going to pay more rent, right? So it works the same way in our business. Um, and that's typically how it goes. If you want to take more space, a tower has limited space, limited engineering capacity. So if you want to take more of our capacity, it's only right that you should pay more money. That's generally how the relationship has always gone. So over the years, because of the... Uh, because of what? What would drive more equipment? There you go. That's it. That's what's driving it. More data, more demand is driving the need for more equipment, which is driving the need for them to come back to us, add equipment, which drives revenues higher. So there's a ton of that going on. And every time that there's a technological upgrade, that's brand new equipment. 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. So 5G is coming, and that's going to be a whole new round of equipment upgrades. <coughs> Did I get them all? Yeah, just how do you think 5G will impact that? Obviously, you're going to have to it's going to be more stuff, and we're going to benefit from that because there's going to be wholesale equipment switch outs. Yeah. Sir? Do you also leave some towers, for example, in Manhattan, or is it usually the buildings that, that lease those out? Buildings. If you, go, if you go through big cities, you will not see many towers. So it's a rooftop business. That is not as good a business. Why is a rooftop business in a big city not as good as a tower business? Partially. 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 Because there's rooftops everywhere. There's no, there's no barriers to entry. Too many rooftops, too many places to go. Towers are great. You get zoning. Nobody can build around you. Rooftops, it's like, oh, you don't want to pay this? Well, I'll just go across the street. You said that you guys avoided uh, bankruptcy by selling off a couple of towers. Huh. A couple 800 towers. Yeah. Did you guys go back and buy those towers back? You want to hear that story? Yeah. So. We, uh, 
we sold those towers, and thank goodness that the capital markets had started to improve. We sold those towers, um, had, the, had the capital markets not improved to the point where the seller was able to get financing, we probably would have had to go bankrupt, but they, they, they did. And on St. Patrick's Day, 2003, we sold 800 towers to a company called AAT. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, 2006, we closed on the purchase of AAT. <laughs> Bought them all back, plus about another thousand. It was a good day. Yes? Um, well, it's inter that's an interesting question, because we don't really compete once we have the asset, because we, we, we really work hard to make sure we get assets that have barriers to entry. And because, zone, because densities are shrinking, what we really compete with, pretend this is a tower, we compete with the carrier's need for coverage in that particular spot. So the carriers either need coverage or they don't. So we don't, we don't ever want to get in a position where we own a tower right next to somebody else. Because then what do you have? You have a type of business which is called a commodity. We don't want to ever be a commodity. We want to be the opposite of a commodity. So what we compete, when we compete, we compete for assets, like new build contracts or asset purchases. That's when we compete. But when once we have the asset, if we've done it right, we're never in this situation. We're in this situation, and it's just a question of does the carrier customer need that spot or not? We've proven over the years that we are indispensable to the delivery of wireless communications. And we're really not a vendor, we're not a supplier, we're landlords. That's our business model. Zoning, zoning and the laws of physics make our business what it is today. Zoning keeps competition away. The laws of physics require that carriers use precision in their engineering and once they're there it keeps the sites there. Does anybody know why People call it cellular. And this factors into kind of what I just said and why, why it all really hangs together well. Why do they call this stuff cellular? Each tower has a sphere of a signal. It works like cells. Every, every tower is a cell and they have to fit together. When a carrier moves one antenna on its tower, they basically have to retune three others because it is a cellular system where they all have to fit together, which is why it's so complicated and why once they have located in a spot, tuned that spot to work in the cellular network, it is so hard to move, which makes our business so sticky. It's proven to be very... Um, recession resistant. Even in the worst of times, 2002 and 2008, when it seemed like you know the rest of the world was melting down, our customers were continuing to spend money. And it really was proven out in 2008 when studies showed that people were cutting back on movies, they were cutting back on restaurants, they were not cutting back on their cell phone bills. That's when wireless use was truly proven to become a staple. And, you know, it just continues to become a wireless world. Every major technology company has a huge wireless uh, initiative. Uh, everything continues to go wireless. Everybody has a, a wireless design. Um, the cable companies are all developing and devoting substantial resources to what their wireless play will be. Uh, it's, it's just going to become an increasingly wireless world.
in the back. You know, that's a great question. Um, I don't think there is, but, you know, that's famous last words, right? That's like what the 8-track tape player probably said before the cassette tape ate it alive. Um, we watch all that carefully. The guys who are most closest to that are the carriers themselves, and we watch what they're doing, and they're not, they're not shying away from their investment in wireless and terrestrial networks. But you're asking the right question. And, you know, we have to, we have to be ever vigilant about that kind of stuff. Yes? Um, what do you think about the uh, pending T-Mobile and Sprint merger? Um, it looks like, and this is a bit of a surprise to me because it was so clearly um, the case that when the government blocked AT&T's purchase of T-Mobile, that competition increased, prices went down. I thought there was going to be more opposition to the merger than what appears to be the case. So I thought it was going to get blocked. I'm not so sure. Um, we took a hit when it was announced. The entire tower sector did. Why? Four tenants goes to three, right? You live in a limited tenant universe, and you lose one, not a good thing. Um, however, both T-Mobile and Sprint have never invested anywhere close to what AT&T and Verizon have invested. They have a fraction of the networks. So what will have to happen for them to be competitive is they will have to step up their investment as a combined company. What we think will happen, and there will be some, some divestiture, some losses, they will not need to be on the same tower. So where they're on the same tower, we're going to lose some revenue if the merger goes through. <coughs> but to offset that, they're going to need to be on a lot more towers to compete with AT&T and Verizon. And they're going to need to add a bunch of equipment where um, they can't offer each other spectrum today. I mean, because think about what will have to happen first. T-Mobile is going to be the surviving network. But they don't want to lose any Sprint people, so they're going to have to immediately add all the spectrum that the Sprint customers' phones are on. So the very first thing that happens is not revenue savings. They actually have to add equipment so they don't lose customers. So actually, the first thing that happens is more revenue before there is actual you know, decommissioning. So of all, the thing, of all the mergers that could happen, I mean, it would, it would be better if we had four equally super strong customers battling it out, each with 25% market share. That would be the ideal thing for a tower company. But that's, that was never going to be the case. So it's not bad to end up with three super strong uh, companies because you didn't have that before. Yes? Uh, what, allowed to, what allowed you to get to the CEO position? That's a good question. Um, and, the, and the answer is a little bit of luck. And I was particularly well suited for this business. But the real answer is um, there was no independent tower industry. I'm one of five or six guys who made all this up. There was no book on the shelf. There was no, hey, I'm going to go be a railroad guy. I'm going to go be a car guy. A um, lot of books on that. There was no independent tower industry. So there's a couple guys at Crown Castle, a couple guys at American Tower, and there's Steve and I. And we're the founders of the modern tower industry. And we made a lot of mistakes along the way, but there wasn't anybody else around to tell us how to do it better. So we, um, and it's been the joy of my life. It's been a blast, it really has. 
Um, but it's a legally intensive business. It's a lot of financing. It's uh, you know a lot of investor relations. I was a corporate securities lawyer, so all those things kind of I knew a little bit about. And um, we just we just went for it, and we happened to be in a very good business, and we surrounded ourselves with good people, and uh, here we are. But there was no script. We got to make it up, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, and hopefully you'll all have that, that joy one day. We run out of time? we got about, about four or five minutes left, but I did want to ask, it's kind of on that line, just a personal story. What have you found to be sort of the most satisfying thing in your time at, uh, at, at SBA and in that leadership role? What's, what's giving you the greatest job satisfaction? Avoiding bankruptcy, for sure. <laughs> No, and I, and, I'm, and I don't. I don't say that lightly. I mean, I, I say that because it was the right thing to do, and doing the right thing is is always the right thing to do. And and you're you're challenged every day as a CEO with with ethical shortcuts and haircuts and and you just you don't want to go there. I mean, and and we have we have been a company that has an extremely high level of integrity and a very strong moral compass. And I take that, you know, very, very, very importantly. Yeah, I mean, that, I take great pride in that. We've never had an issue with the SEC, never had a, a, a serious compliance issue. Um, you know, we may, uh, we may not have uh, made as much money as we perhaps could have had we cut some corners, but I'm, I'm just as happy that we've done, we've done just fine. Well, if we only have a couple minutes, let me see what we're missing here. So here's some tower basics. I think we've covered a lot of this stuff. It's a very long-term recurring business. You know, that's why we trade at high multiples. That's why we can finance very easily, very predictable. Customers aren't going anywhere, long-term contracts, very high credit. We don't have to chase anybody for money. We don't have a big receivables department. We don't have a big marketing department, right? It's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a sold product, right? This is a totally demand-driven product. You can't go out and have like a Walmart blue light special on tower space because it costs them, costs them half a million dollars to put um, this equipment out there. And they don't do that. They don't do that because you're gonna give them 50 bucks off on the rent. They either need the spot or they don't. So we don't have a big sales department, we don't have a big marketing department, and we sure don't have a big accounts collectible department. These are the different kind of towers. These guide towers are the cheapest, they can hold the most, but they need the most land because these guy anchors have to be you know, out there. You typically need an acre. These need the least amount of land. Oftentimes these are required by local zoning boards. These are thought to be uh, more attractive. I don't know why. I think they're pretty ugly, actually. Um, these are typically what we build because these have the best um, uh, relationship of cost to capacity. And then there's a bunch of things that you probably don't even know are towers. You ever drive down on any five and see a super like cross on a church that looks totally like out of place and out of proportion? That's the cell tower. Yeah, that's, you ever seen the, the top of the, um, the Greek Orthodox Church on Yamato? That's a cell tower. Um, fl flag poles that look like they're this big, those are cell towers. There's, there's a bunch of others. There's rocks in Arizona that are cell towers. Cigarro cactuses, cell towers. Oh, here's the best one. There's a tree fake tree in Mount Vernon that they make the carriers change the leaves every season. That's a cell tower. It's expensive cell tower. Expensive cell tower. A lot more stuff coming down the pike. More, uh, our, our government, um, thankfully, is very pro-broadband, bringing, bringing internet to the masses, making sure everybody has um, capabilities and they're going to put more spectrum out there to do that. 
Why is putting more spectrum out there good for the uh, tower business? Got to have more equipment. Got to have more radios. Yes, sir. What's the average lease term? Average lease term? The average lease term is five years legally, but it comes with five five-year renewal options. And because they never leave, it's a 30-year you know, effective lease term with the escalators already built in. Here's the density uh, graphic. This is what the uh, surge in data has done to densities. This is why carriers sold their towers. They needed the money. They have so many more cell sites that they have to deploy today to deliver the service so these ladies can stream their videos in super fast speeds, which I love. Is it a good, good movie? Good. Data speeds going up. Mobile data traffic just continues to soar. And one of the things that we have done, um, because uh, there's nothing like uh, pride of ownership, is all of our employees are stockholders, every single one. Happy ones, too. That's it. <laughs>